Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta and in Butte, Montana or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Thanks, Sherry, and thank you, Global Patties. You know, each week we get to talk about how much we appreciate our sponsor support, and we know you'd rather we get right to talking about beekeeping. However, our great sponsors are critical to help making all of this happen. From the transcripts, the hosting fees, the software, the hardware, the microphones, the subscriptions, the recorders, they enable each episode. So with that, thanks to Bee Culture Magazine for continuing their presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture has been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. Subscribe to Bee Culture today. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We're really happy you're here. Before we get started, just a quick reminder to subscribe or follow Beekeeping Today podcast and give us a five-star rating. It really does help. Also, we are now adding complete transcripts of each episode on the website after the show notes. Check them out. You can also leave questions and comments online under each show. You can leave a comment, ask a question, reply to a question, ours or our listeners. Click on leave a comment at the top of the episode's show notes to join the discussion. Have you listened to an episode and thought, that person sounds really interesting and I'd like to know more about them? Well, now you can. Each episode links to a guest profile. Each profile has a guest photo, bio, contact information, including Instagram and Twitter details if they have them. Check it out. And finally, share the podcast with your beekeeping friends. Email them links or mention it at your next beekeeper meeting. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast. We're really glad you're here. Sitting across the table here at Beekeeping Today headquarters is, a Beekeeping Today podcast headquarters, is good friend Dr. James to Jim. Welcome back to Beekeeping Today podcast. I'm always happy to be here uh, across your virtual table. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, we're kind of sharing sharing duties here. Uh, yeah, I joined yeah. you on Honey Bee Obscura uh, in Kim's absence, and you're joining uh, me here on Beekeeping Today uh, all, during the same time. But Kim will be back here shortly, and so we're both looking forward to that. Yep, I am. I've, I've had a good time, though. I don't want to talk behind Kim's back, but oh, no. since he couldn't be here, I was happy to fill in. <laughs> That's right. So how how are you? So I'll ask you what I ask Kim all the time. How are your bees doing? It's it's the beginning of April, and no no joking. Yeah. Well, I'll <laughs> tell you what Kim probably tells you all the time. My bees look like they've been beaten up. They're coming out of winter, mm -hmm. and it's hard to tell that winter is ended. Uh, you know, Northeast Ohio. You have to have some reason for living here, I guess. There's <laughs> snow and ice right now on a nice spring day. And I just, to you, Jeff, and to the listeners, you just get antsy because maple's in bloom and early spring sources are out there and the bees desperately need it. Yeah. And they can't get to it because it's another typical late winter, early spring, northeast Ohio day with some freezing rain and snow. Well, I remember... When I lived there in, in, in Hinckley, in Medina area, that uh, the Tri-County meeting that you and Kim talked about several episodes ago on Honey Bee Obscura, and yep, going to that yep. in the snowstorm, or not snowstorm, but, but being snowing and cold and wrapped up and everything, that's very, very frustrating time in many Thanks parts of the country. Bringing back painful memories <laughs> there. Or what do you do if you've invited a thousand people to come to your meeting and it snows eight inches that day? Yeah. It was always antsy. Is it going to do it or not? But yeah. That's an old memory, Jeff. I don't do that work anymore. On today's show, we have visiting with us is Andoni Melanthopoulos from the Oregon State University Extension Service. Uh, you know Andoni? I, I, I have. 
I don't want, you know, he's not my age, but he's, mm-hmm. he's been there for quite a while. And the last time I was there all those years ago, he was there and he's surrounded by a lot of good people that are good, do good bee, bee work in the Pacific Northwest. We've had him on the show in the past, and he's always full of good stories, and he has his own podcast. I'm sure we'll talk about that. It's called Pollination. And I highly encourage everybody to go out and find that podcast on Apple or wherever you listen to your podcast. Um, so we'll we look forward to talking to him real shortly. And first, uh, Ed Colby stopped by not too long ago and dropped off a new story uh, from his uh, beekeeper's life, Tales from the Bottom Board book. Uh, have you heard him talk before? I have. I have. And, he, you know, he's a, a writer also. He's mm-hmm. powerful repute. He's, he is he is in bee culture almost immediately after your column every month. So I figured you were close, if only on paper. Yep. <laughs> Apparently, we jostle to be the very last. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I think that I'm that close to the end because I'm usually the last to get my monthly article submitted. <laughs> I don't know if that's how they schedule uh, that. I don't but... know if that's how they do it either, but I'm afraid that's the case. But no, he has a position of honor. He is officially the last page. I think I have a position of just being tardy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, on that note, let's uh, let's listen now to Ed from his book. A Beekeeper's Life, Tales from the Bottom Board. February 2014, The Beekeeper Handshake. Our hosts promised that a driver would meet us when we landed in Kiev, Ukraine. With a formidable language barrier, I wondered how we would connect. Not to worry, a poker-faced gentleman, dressed all in black, stood waiting for us holding a sign that read simply, Ed Colby. When I shook his hand, he picked up my gal Marilyn's bag and quickly led us to a waiting car. My memory of the ride into town is a juxtaposition of golden domed Orthodox churches and severe Soviet style apartment complexes. Road signs in inscrutable Cyrillic, dramatic communist era statues, the impatient but orderly flow of traffic. Our guide and driver murmuring in Russia in the front seat. The broad Dnieper River. Handsome, angular, big-boned Ukrainians hurrying in the streets. Stunning women dressed to kill. I said, Marilyn, we're not in Kansas anymore. At a four-story building practically right next to ancient St. Sophia Cathedral, the manager handed us the key to our top floor apartment. Welcome to Ukraine. Welcome to Apomondia. Now let me make myself perfectly clear. Marilyn and I are not important people. Drivers do not ordinarily pick us up at airports. We just got lucky. In the summer, as part of my job as a ranger on Aspen Mountain, I give weekly lectures on honeybees and beekeeping. At the first one, three Julys ago, I met the most charming family beekeeper and former Ukrainian president Viktor Yushchenko, his wife Katerina, and daughters Christina and Sophia. Nobody else showed up for my talk, so Mr. President and I did the secret beekeeper handshake, then sat down in the ski patrol hut and talked about our little darlings. An hour later, I had a personal invitation to Apomondia 2013, the International Bee Conference in Kiev. When I muttered something about the cost of such a trip, the First Lady said, I'll find you a place to sleep. She was true to her word and then some. We found champagne and roses on the dining table and chocolates. A few days later at their dacha outside of Kiev, Mr. President served his signature carp soup. We dined outside by the lake, all bundled up on a damp fall evening. Second course, pork kebab. I sat next to President Yushchenko. I watched him cut his meat into tiny slices and feed it to the cat under the table. We were questioned, as average Americans, about our views on the Syrian chemical weapons crisis, then very much in the news. So for a brief moment in time, 
We represented the whole United States of America. Marilyn and I were both glad we had an opinion to share. Passionate about honeybees, Mr. President keeps 300 hives. I got the biggest laugh when I explained that Michelle Obama's single White House hive was strapped down tight to protect it from presidential helicopter prop wash. Beekeeping is the Ukrainian national pastime. Viktor Andreevich explained that his country has four and a half million beekeepers in a population of 45 million. He informed us that the monks at Ukraine's monasteries all make mead. I said, well, what do you expect in a country with so many monasteries and so much honey? He said, when you come back next year, you'll have to sample my honey beer. After supper, Mr. President led us on a tour of his private beekeeping museum, a vast collection that chronicles the evolution of Ukrainian beekeeping, from hollow logs to Ukrainian-style removable frame hives. You never in your life saw so much bee stuff. Long ago, Ukrainian beekeepers believed that hives had to be high up in the trees. We looked at a giant wheel used to winch hives into the treetops. Viktor Andreevich said, I've taken many heads of state through my bee museum. Muammar Gaddafi, Vladimir Putin, Bill Clinton. He mentioned a world leader whose name you'd surely recognize. How did he like his museum tour, I wondered out loud. Oh, him? He doesn't like anything, President Yushchenko laughed. You'd chuckle if I told you who we were talking about. But I'm dancing on thin ice here. Maybe I was on thin ice when I emailed former President Yushchenko some political advice. Was that presumptuous? Because what do I know? But right now, mid-December 2013, hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians confront the police to protest a different Ukrainian president. One who threatens to pull his nation deep into the maw of the Russian bear. Politics are one thing, the beekeeper bond quite another. Marilyn and I reflect in near disbelief. What extraordinary kindness and hospitality. Two years after an impulsive offer from strangers, I wrote, in so many words, we're coming. Did you really mean it? And the reply, we can't wait to see you. In these troubled times, we pray for Ukraine and count our blessings. Hey, thanks a lot, Ed, for dropping off the story. That's pretty entertaining. Yep. Th thank you. Nicely done. Yeah, Nicely it done. <laughs> it's fun to listen to. All right. Well, let's uh, get right to our interview with Andoni Melanthopoulos. But first, a quick word from our friends at Strong Microbials. Hello, beekeepers. Your honeybees face a lot of challenges out there. Unbalanced food sources from monoculture crops, holding yards, drought, food shortages, antibiotics, pesticides, and pathogens like chalk brood. To overcome these challenges, your bees need the multiple bacteria that are in all nectars, pollens, and the environment. These bacteria aid honeybees' digestion and improve your honeybees' response and resilience to pesticides. Now you can help improve your honey colony health with a quick, easy, and safe-to-use product. Strong Microbial's Super DFM Honeybee uses naturally occurring bacteria to restore the healthy gut biome of your honeybees. Check them out today at www.strongmicrobials.com. Thanks, Strong Microbials. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Sitting across the virtual Zoom table right now is Andoni Melanthopoulos, all the way right down I-5 for me in the Corvallis, Oregon. That is right. I am just down there. If I'm down here in oh. beautiful Oregon, look at that. It's looking nice out here finally. It's actually sunny this afternoon. <laughs> and that's the bright stuff in the back of the, the screen here. It's not the light. So welcome to the show. <laughs> um, just want to let you know, Andoni, that uh, it, Dr. Jim Tu is here uh, in, in Kim's place. Uh, well, Kim's out for a couple of weeks, and I think you know each other from past work. We do know each other. You may not want to admit it, Anthony, but we we know each other for a long time. 
I'm such a big admirer, so. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> you've always, you've been a, a good man there for a long time. It's hard to find good extension people. Well, we were talking about that, you know, at the break, just in terms of, you know, who I am. I'm an extension person, right? So, like, who, yep. what I am. And it's, uh, you know, it's a dying breed, you know, extension apiculture. There isn't a lot of new positions being created. And so, um, but it is such a necessary part of uh, beekeeping. I completely agree. I'm, I'm sold. I, I, I'm sold too. And I, I might have mentioned to you guys before that um, my first first deep dive into beekeeping was through Extension Service with Jim there at Ohio State in Worcester. So, um, but it's kind of a circle here uh, of extension people, extension mm-hmm. experience. Um, so, Andoni, I, again, welcome back. You were with us way back in 2020 in, in the pre-COVID times. I, I guess we could go, you know, BC before COVID. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, um, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and we talked to, uh, we kind of introduced our, our listeners then, but if you would, uh, just kind of give us, uh, just a recap of who you are and what you do there in extension for Oregon state. And, um, and then we can start our discussion. Well, like Jim, I'm a, I'm an extension person, and um, and I guess the thing is, is OSU, Oregon State University. Sorry, Jim. <laughs> it's okay. The other OSU. <laughs> the other OSU. The has OSU. A fantastic <laughs> apiculture extension program. Dr. Ramesh Sagili heads up a program. It's got a master beekeeping program. Oregon did not need an apiculture extension person. So the best way to define my role. Ramesh deals with everything inside the colony, and I deal with everything outside the colony. There's a bit of leakage there because, of course, Ramesh is one of the premier uh, uh, extension and research people working on honeybee nutrition. Mm. So he's very concerned with what goes on out there. But I really focus in on uh, working with land managers, making sure that they're putting pollinator habitat in place, making sure uh, when they're applying pesticides, it doesn't affect uh, bees. And then... I'm a honeybee person, but I had to make the transition, as all extension people have to do. You have to do multiple things. And I head up the largest native bee monitoring program uh, in the U.S. of any state, which I'm very proud of. And it's run by volunteers. They're not, you know, there's master beekeepers. They're master melatologists. <laughs> <laughs> melatologists. That has nothing to do with metals. No, it's, you know, it's funny. It's, it's, it's the study of bees. And if you pick up the premier book of, you know, melatology, uh, Charles Michener's Bees of the World, on the front yep. cover, there's a honeybee. So <laughs> well, the most, the most widely known. And after yeah. that would be probably the bumblebee. Uh, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a fantastic program and a, and a fast, fantastic uh, lead into what you're doing. And one of the big things that we wanted to talk about was uh, your work with beekeepers and applicators on, with pesticides. And, and there's, we were talking in the pre-show here a little bit about the, all of the changes that have happened. Can you kind of recap some of that and why? I mean, as a beekeeper, I know pesticides are dangerous and a bad thing, but yet then many beekeepers turn around and spray their foliage around their houses. And and so l- let's talk about pesticides, pesticide use, and pollinators slash honeybees. Well, you know, pesticides are essential. They're really important. You know, here in Oregon, we have specialty seed growers that grow everything from chicory seed all the mm. way to, you know, cherries, cranberries. And to grow those crops on a commercial scale competitively requires the use of pesticides. Uh, no doubt about it. And, you know, my mentor here in Oregon, uh, beekeeper Harry Vanderpool in, out of Salem, talks to a lot of uh, pesticide applicators in what I'll talk about in a second in terms of pesticide training. And the th- first thing he does when he walks into a room of pesticide applicators, he thanks them for what they do. He said he goes to a vector control meeting where they spray aerial insecticides. And Harry will walk into the room right away and say, Thank you so much for the important work that you're doing. It's critical. And I'm here just to tell you about how you can get your job done and have minimal impacts on my bees. And I think that's, um, you know, one thing to sort of point out right from the outset is any beekeeper that's involved with crop pollination knows that the pollination is one element input into that crop. 
but also keeping the pest down. If you have good pollination and botrytis blight rots all the blossoms off, there's no crop. So they know that it's a partnership. But I, you know, Jim and I were talking about this, that EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, which came about in the 1970s, uh, regulates environmental hazards. And Jim, when, when, do you, when did you start to see bee-related language uh, on pesticide labels? I've got to take a walk down memory lane, but that was in the late 80s, 90s, that bees begin to routinely appear on the label. Before that, it was unusual. Uh, plenty of bees, no problem. If some were died off, you can just get more. But that began to change, uh, as I recall, in the early 90s. The early 90s. And in the, at that time, thanks, Jim, that's good, because I, I, I know this happened before I started paying attention. There's a whole lot of researchers and extension people don't know that history, don't realize that you know beekeepers had to deal with pesticide poisonings in the 80s. And there was, you know, it came to the, you know, the attention of e uh, EPA, which regulates environmental hazards. And as a consequence, those pesticide labels, which are legal documents, when you buy, when you go to Home Depot and you pick up a pesticide, you don't know this, but that label is a legal document that you have to adhere to. And if you don't, it's a, pen it, you know, it's a, it's against federal law. The Federal Insecticide and Rodenticide Act. You have to follow it according to that label. And if you don't, um, you know, you're breaking the law, essentially. Better Bee is pleased to sponsor today's episode of Beekeeping Today podcast. For over 40 years, Better Bee has supplied beekeepers across the country with the tools, equipment, and knowledge needed to succeed. Because many Better Bee employees are beekeepers themselves, they understand your needs and challenges and are better prepared to answer your beekeeping questions. From their colorful catalog to their support of beekeeper educational activities, including this podcast, Better Bee truly lives up to their tagline of beekeepers serving beekeepers. See for yourself at betterbee.com. So those pesticide labels have been around, you know, for a long time before EPA and starting in the 80s, they started to have warnings on the label about, about uh, protecting honeybees. And you see it. If you pick up any label, anybody got something in your, you know, some weed killer or something. If you open up that label, which is going to be attached to it, and you look for a section called environmental hazards, you're going to parse that part of the label looking for the, you know, keywords. Is it toxic or highly toxic to bees? And I might say bees and other pollinating insects. And then there will be another statement on there called the residual toxicity statement that says, do not allow, apply this product or allow it to drift on blo to blooming weeds, weeds when bees are actively uh, or actively foraging or foraging. And so those, those two pieces of language on the label tell you if the product, if it landed on a bee, would it kill it? And how long? After it landed on, let's say, a flower, would it degrade to a point when it's, you know, relatively non-toxic to bees? All pesticide labels have that. Hmm. Go to any pesticide label right now, open it up, and if it doesn't make mention of it, then you know that it's not acutely toxic to bees and doesn't have any residual toxicity. A great example of this, you know, there's m no herbicide labels will have this warning. I, I think there's an old one, Paraquat used to have a warning. But no herbicide labels will say that. You look at any herbicide label, there will be no mention of bee toxicity. As a beekeeper, uh, well, I have a, a bunch of flooding my head with full of questions, so I apologize as I stumble and, and stammer here. The, are the labels the same between what I pick up at the local box store and what an applicator at the farm store finds? Unfortunately, in most cases, yes. So... Um, the language is standardized, so the that language in the environmental hazard section is laid out when a pesticide company goes to register a product. EPA has standard language they're supposed to adhere to, mm -hmm. and some of that language is complicated. And I know um, some companies over the past few years have tried to simplify the messages on icons on the front panel of the pesticide label. So a lot of home and garden products, if the pesticide company is paying attention and is invested is trying to simplify that message because that message is complicated. I just walked you through one provision of the yeah. label 
and you know, and I'm sure many of your listeners will. I didn't quite get that. I got to re-listen to it. There are many provisions on that label, and you know, it is not in a language that's easy for people to understand. And so, yes, unfortunately, most labels look identical if it's for a home and garden use or if it's for a commercial applicator. I will add that none of the labels have type that's big enough to read. <laughs> well, there's so much to read. Well, there's so much it, to read and it's, it's so damn uh, small. And I'm scanning, I'm scanning all that information looking for my words, B, pollinators. And I'm scanning through all the the application rate, the you know, the bloom development time. I'm looking for my key words there as fast as I can read that small print. It, it is it is a challenge, and and so so how is the best way to scan a, a label as, as a beekeeper? What do you? So you mentioned to go to the environmental hazards section first. Is there any place else I need to check look for uh, for a quick synopsis with with so I don't have to read that entire label? Yeah, we do. Uh, we have produced a card um, that uh, we distribute through the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign. That kind of breaks the label down, mm-hmm. um, and uh, uh, the there's also a group, Anna Heck, who you've no doubt had on a previous show from Michigan State University. Um, she heads up a, a working group, the Managed Pollinator Protection Working Group, uh, funded mm-hmm. by the Northwest IPM Center, and they 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 we produce stacks of those cards and give them to commercial applicators so that they can understand how those um, how that works, but. Basically, there's two things. Well, there's a couple things. Let me just, the labels from the time, you know, uh, that Jim remembers in the 80s and 90s only had the environmental hazards sections. Mm -hmm. And it has a very clear statement about is it toxic or highly toxic to bees. Then it has this rather gnomic um, residual toxicity statement. Now, I want you guys to try and I'm going to read two statements to you. and want you to tell me (laughs) which one do you think would break down overnight? This product is, no, I'm going to tell you, I'm, no, this, this is the test. I actually test all commercial <laughs> pesticide applicators with this question. It's a poll question before I give training to them. And I ask them, if the product says, do not apply this product when bees are foraging on the treated area, can you apply this product at night? Oh, geez, I hate pop quizzes. Um, yes or no. You got to, uh, one more time. Yeah, please. Do not apply this product when bees are foraging on the treated area. Can you apply this product safely at night? Yes, according to that label. That is incorrect. Yeah, see? See, the, it's, if it said, do not apply when bees are actively foraging on the treated area. So you can see how complicated this is. Without training, there's absolutely no way in, on earth you would know what that meant. Yeah. Say, ask, say, make the statement again because it's very detailed. So the One difference more time. is... So you'll see this in the second line. First line will say, this product is toxic or highly toxic to bees. Then it will say, do not apply this product or allow it to drift onto blooming weeds if the product is, if bees are foraging on the treated area. Okay. Versus do not apply when bees are, it doesn't say treated area, actually, sorry. Do not apply when bees are foraging. As opposed to do not apply when bees are actively foraging. Actively. So the, the key word is actively foraging. Actively tells yeah. you the product will break down overnight. So and if, active would be the word that allows you to apply it at night. That's right. Very tricky. Yeah. And no wonder no wonder that uh, people can get, get, get crosswise with beekeepers and others uh, because they misread the label or the label was... I don't want to say misleading, but not clearly written. I have trained commercial pesticide applicators, and I always start the training off by asking them a series of questions about the label. Mm -hmm. And I would say, by and large, 75% of the the people who are licensed pesticide applicators in the state of Oregon who have not had training for me in the past get that question wrong. Right. Yeah. So are all uh, pesticide applicators, they're licensed in every state? Is that an EPA? Okay, requ- so here's the trick. So yeah. they're licensed or certified. It depends where you are. So what happened? Here's a, a long story, but it's a good story. So <laughs> back when EPA was formed, um, they found out there was a there was a complicated clause from old pesticide legislation that said if you know that essentially rendered a whole bunch of pesticides, their registrations would have been canceled with the formation of EPA. 
So what EPA did is they created a new class of pesticides. Everybody's heard of this, or many people have heard of this, the restricted use pesticide. Restricted use pesticide means you need additional training to buy them. You can't go to Home Depot and buy a restricted use pesticide. You need to be certified. The federal government uh, has some broad criteria around certification, but depending on which state you are, um, some credits, some some states you have continuing education credits. So you have to take your test. You have to be certified by taking a test. But to retain your license or certification over time in a state like Oregon and in many states, imagine Ohio's this way, you have to take continuing education credits. That's where they come to find me because they got a they go to a room and it's, you know, they've got six hours. They hear from the person who talks about personal protection equipment and they hear about worker protection standards. And then I come on stage for 60 minutes and I have their attention. They have to be there to get their credits and retain their license. They have to be there. And this is becomes the real excellent opportunity to educate pesticide applicators. And I have done polls across the country and many, many, many states don't take advantage of this. Hmm. It's a captive audience, folks. They have to be there. They're, they got their coffee, their donuts, and they're paying attention to you. And if you're entertaining, you can get their attention because there's huh. some pretty boring talks on herbicide, you know, drift. How can I find out if uh, 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 an applicator is licensed, a pesticide applicator is licensed or certified? Is that a requirement? It's I a requ- mean, yeah. It will be. If you're in an agri... Well, no. So in Oregon... If you're applying a pesticide professionally, you know, you're, it's your business, you're going to need a license. So there's certain caveats. If you're a homeowner, you don't, but you can't buy a pesticide in Oregon from Home Depot and apply it for a fee to somebody else's property. So a license, so the license has two things. The one is, or the cert, be certified means that Either you're going to be applying restricted use pesticides or you're going to be doing it as a kind of commercial business, in which case in both cases you're going to have to get or you're working on public property. So people who work for schools, who maintain the grounds of schools, you know, they all have to be certified. Hmm. Well, Anthony, can I just walk two houses down, please, with a can, with a can of Raid Wasp and Hornet spray and try to take out a yellow jacket nest in the ground for a neighbor who thinks that my honeybees are doing that? Am I a good oh, Samaritan geez. or am I a lawbreaker? Wow. <laughs> that, yeah, that was a I, – I don't know the answer. But I, I can tell you where you would find the answer is the state departments of agriculture ha- will all have pesticide divisions. And so if you're a beekeeper and you're sort of like, you know, I'm really worried about this neighbor. Uh, she, she or he seems to be going around the neighborhood spraying things. You can call your state department of agriculture and ask them and they will know the answer immediately. Okay. I'm not saying that happened to me. <laughs> Just in case that the answer is you're a lawbreaker. I was saying maybe that would be a possible scenario. It might be. And it gets tricky. You know, I think there's a, there's ways in which, and I think this gets into what I really would like to talk about. So this environmental hazard statement was there for a long time. But in some states, it wasn't enforceable. If you talk to, uh, because environmental hazards are not, in even when it says, I've, I've talked to a bunch of pesticide um, state agencies about this, even when it says do not apply this product when bees are, you know, visiting the treated area or foraging in the treated area, even that, even this is do not apply, it's in some states it's not enforceable. And so in the last 10 years or so, EPA has been wise to, the, it has been thinking about this for a long time. They knew they had language that wasn't clear, that people couldn't understand around bees and pollinators. And they knew they had language that in some states, it wouldn't stand up to scrutiny. If you applied your, you know, you, you sprayed during full bloom and it said it was a highly toxic pesticide, that in some states that wouldn't be enforceable as a kind of violation. They knew that what they needed to do was uh, beef up how they assess the risk of pesticides to bees. And this is the big transition. So for all of those years, it was a hazard statement. It said it's toxic to bees, but it doesn't tell you, you know, in which context, at what rate, um, you know, if you applied it on turf with no flowering plants, the 
the risk to bees is low, even though the hazard is high, the potential, it's a toxic product, but bees don't go to, you know, turf unless there's clover growing there. So EPA instituted a risk assessment along with the EU member states in Canada. And now you see pesticide labels, the new ones are much different. I didn't know, I didn't know all this. I've been out of the loop too long. You know, Jim, I know you're not the only one. Most of my colleagues don't know this because it's, it's, you know, there's a, there's a lot of research that's been done on insecticides and pesticides, but without an extension focus, without having to, yes. you know, look in the, look into the whites of the eyes of like the person putting the pesticide on and understanding where their conundrum is, like where the, in, the information breaks down, you would never know this. I've only had to learn this because I've had to train on it and I've had to sort of yeah. have people come up to me and say, listen, what do I, what do I do? You told me that bees provide all this value to pollination and all this stuff that I already knew, but you didn't tell me anything about what I need to do because I just need to know what to do. That is always so painful because the, the guy doesn't want to kill bees. I mean, he's not an evil person. He's just, you know, trying to control pest insects. And here he's got these RA beekeepers bombarding him because they're frustrated because they control Varroa and they had small high beetle traps in and whatever. And then they have this outside force that would kill their bees. So everywhere you turn would be anxiety and, and foment. Well, and I think EPA kind of wised on to this when, you know, when issues with bees started to bubble up, you know, well, almost 20 years ago now, eh? Yep. 2006. They, you know, I think they took it really seriously and they worked on this problem. And it and it's a little bit of a shame because I think not only do, you know, university, you know, extension, but particularly researchers don't know this, but I think beekeepers themselves are unaware of what these changes are. And they are quite far reaching. And they, there's, um, so you, there's two things. The first thing is, and I get this question all the time. Well, I see these bee diamonds, right? There, many people have heard that after, you know, when neonics became, neonicotinoid insecticides became an issue, EPA in record time, they don't never move this fast, issued amendments to their labels so that they had this bee with a red diamond around it. And everybody thought that that was the new label, but it's, uh, it was an interim measure, actually. You only find it on neonicotinoid labels. Uh, oh. And mm -hmm. EPA is phasing them out. It was kind of like a interim measure to, before they could get everything worked out. And the new labels don't have any B diamonds or anything. But what they do have is you'll read for, I'm working in a crucifer crop. And it'll say at this rate and this rate. And then it'll say real clearly, don't apply until the petals have fallen off the plant. Clear language. It's as clear as day. And that's enforceable. If you apply that now while there's bloom on that plant, it is clearly, it's a federal offense, very clearly. And so um, what's happened is EPA has created the conditions for clear language, um, a much more robust assessment. So in the old days, you just had to, you know, they had the acute toxicity test where you had honeybees and you applied the pesticide, you figured out the dose at which they die. Now, yeah. every new pesticide needs oral and uh, contact acute tests, but they also have to look at chronic tests. They have to test the toxicity against larva. All of that is new. And it's when you get the labels now, there's just a lot more data behind them. Language is clear and it's enforceable. Hmm. Do any of the labels take into account the synergistic effect between multiple pesticides? No, they do not. They, yeah, they're done. So from a risk assessor's perspective, if they're looking at, I want to, I want to, this new product has come to us. A, a company wants to register this new product and they want to know what provisions for mitigation need to be associated with it. You know, what I mean by mitigation is they say, well, maybe it has to be applied only when there's no bloom on the plant, which is the highest risk. But the way that the registration system works, it doesn't take into account, well, uh, there's a there's a caveat to this. It doesn't take into account the broader range of what it's going to be sprayed alongside with. There is a way in which in human health, though, there was this thing called the risk cup. So the organophosphates, uh, you know, pesticides that, you know, Jim and I were talking about that caused a lot of bee kills 
they also had a lot of negative effects on people. And what EPA did at, you know, in the 90s under this, sorry, uh, we should probably, you probably want to hear about making, you know, two queen colonies, but let, here, <laughs> legislation, <laughs> Food Quality Protection Act, what it did was it said that EPA won't allow another register. They looked at the aggregate exposure for human beings to organophosphates and they said, we won't allow, an, we, we looked at the broad diet of what a human being eats. They eat an apple, they eat an orange, you know, they, and if we look at the broad consumption patterns, we won't, we can't allow another registration of an organophosphate uh, until that cup, you know, the aggregate exposure went down. And so that, actually, that's what drove the innovation of the neonicotinoids. Because the message to registrants, the people who make pesticides, was clear that you have to lower the toxicity to humans. And neonicotinoids are, you know, some of the least toxic to human insecticides. But, you know, they have this other unintended consequences. They're highly toxic to bees. So there is a provision. There is a way in which EPA at one point, when people were really concerned about human health hazard, they looked at things in aggregate and they had a mechanism for doing that, but not currently with bee health. No. If you look at each product individually. Well, we've gone down. I mean, this is a fascinating topic and, and perhaps we should have you back to talk specifically and only about pesticides. But I do want to talk about a couple other projects you're working on. If unless Jim, you have something else you no, I've I'm like you. There's questions everywhere, but it's very good information, Anthony. So a follow up question: uh, You know, the springtime where where people are starting to think about pollination and 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 where they can take their bees this year. I, we touched on the last episode a little bit uh, on the pollination issues around blueberries, and I know you are involved with the blueberry pollination in Oregon. Can you? Kind of give us a quick synopsis of what the issue is and what beekeepers need to be aware of. Well, the first issue is that you know, rental rates for blueberry have been static for mm. a long time. People still get $55 a colony, you know, and it's been uh, irrespective of the colony quality, too. I've seen, you know, great variation in terms of the strength of the colonies delivered. So, Issue number one, rates have been very low. Mm -hmm. The second thing is, and this has been reported, I'm sure it came up in your previous podcast, that bees are getting beat up for some reason in blueberry. Mm -hmm. And it's been, you know, talk to any beekeeper here in the Willamette Valley where all our, where the bulk of our blueberries are grown. They all come out with brood diseases. And in fact, I had a student work on this and just characterize the intensity of you know, how much European fowl brood, the main thing, because, you know, all the other things, sack brood, chalk brood, they, they didn't seem to track nearly the way European fowl brood did. And, you know, they come in with very little European fowl brood and they leave with a lot of European fowl brood. And then the beekeepers got, you know, a month or two of trying to fix that problem. It just jams them up for the rest of the year. And of course, this is not a new problem, is it, Jim? No, it's not a new problem. It's been around for <laughs> decades, except it's gotten worse because you can't run by teramycin now the way you used to be able to by teramycin. It's a tricky thing as well because, you know, the you know the beekeepers cannot get antibiotics the same way that you could. Mm. As, as you see, I you know spend a little bit of time in the bee colony, but not nearly enough. <laughs> but the other problem is, you know, when you're coming into blueberry, you want a super. You know, you got to, you're coming into blueberry and they're going to swarm if you don't super. And yep. so you're supering. And so you kind of already, the withdrawal times for oxytet are already expired. So you're kind of stuck. You're kind of going in into a crop where it's notorious for European fowl brood flare ups. And you're, um, you're, you're uh, you can't really medicate. And you've got this low pollination rate. And so there's been, you know, a lot of aggravation. And I think the ble blueberry growers here in Oregon have heard it and they are interested in coming up with solutions, but it has been an irritant in Oregon yeah. and it's an important crop for the state at the same time. And, and they don't have those issues with any of the other crops. I mean, cause you did mention there's a lot of seed crops. There's, I, I know there's apples in Oregon. There's so, but it's primarily and predominantly in, in the blueberries. Yeah, that's, but uh, so Dr. Sagili is working on this problem. So he's looking at, you know, because the other place you can go is do, you know, 
uh, you know, tree fruits, which happen about the same time. And, you know, we never hear problems in tree fruits. So it seems to be blueberry associated, but what it is, is unclear. I know Dr. Sigili and others have, you know, hypothesized there's a nutritional deficiency, but, um, you know, I think many people have looked at that and have not resolved it through that, giving colonies pollen patties. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when I go through colonies that are in, and I've been through in through them through during blueberry pollination, often we'll get a whole slab, a frame full of pollen. So I'm not convinced that that's the issue. Gordy Wardell had that when he was at Michigan State University, had this whole idea about the acidity. No, no, the alkalinity of blueberry nectar. And that's, I think, you know, why those patties had were acidified. Hmm. This idea that if you acidify the pollen patties, that'll deal with it. But the, there's been all sorts of theories and nobody can nail it down. And the one thing that we've been working with, there's a project led by Rufus Isaac at Michigan State University that we're replicating in Florida, Oregon, and uh, uh, Washington, is we're looking at the placement of the colonies. Because one thing that I hear from beekeepers that they're irritated with in a lot of pollination system is the grower has them drop a pallet drive down, drop a pallet, drive down, drop a pallet. And often those pallets of bees are right up against the crop. There's no way you mm -hmm. can protect that last row of blueberries and not spray the colony. And so we've been looking at situations where the colonies are dispersed versus putting them all in a landing in a safe spot with a nice buffer away from the crop and seeing if there's any decrease in pollination. And the first year of work from Washington and Oregon suggests there's no decrease because the reason mm -hmm. the grower is spacing them all around is they think I'm going to have a spot that's not well pollinated. But it certainly seems, at least in the first year of data, they're getting just as good a pollination by setting the colonies back a ways and putting them in a nice, safe spot. Not, I don't know. It's unlikely to be the smoking gun. There's been smarter people than me that have, you know, Shimanuki went into that USDA, did a whole lot of work on this. Yeah. Right, Jim? There's a lot of people very smart that have been working on it, this. It goes back a long time. EFB has always been, uh, what, sneaky. Uh, some colonies have it. Some cow colonies had it badly. High rot next to it. Never had any effects of it at all. So uh, you just this, it's just always a mystery where it came from, why they've got it, why they didn't all get it, how you got rid of it. One thing that we are planning to do is sit down. We've done this with the Clover the Clover Commission and also the specialty seed growers here in Western Oregon is sit down with the uh, Blueberry Commission this fall and try to sit down and think and have blueberry growers, crop consultants and beekeepers in the room and extension and just hammer out like have it out. Like where are these points of irritation? Because, you know, sometimes I think these pollination systems keep going because you know, beekeepers, have, there's a, a lot of honeybee colonies left after almonds that are looking for a place to go. Right. And it leads to, you know, I think undervaluing of the bee colonies. And we've seen this here in Oregon. I did a study where we, my student did a study, looking at strong colonies going into pollination at four colonies an acre versus weak ones. And there's a huge increase in yield. And I don't know if that's getting compensated. You know, there mm. there's actual benefits that I don't know that are, you know, not being paid for that should be. There's a big benefit to grading a colony, getting a strong one in there and keeping it strong for the grower. I do want to ask you about the the uh, the two other programs we mentioned early on, and that was the the Oregon Bee Atlas and Oregon Master Metallologist, Mel uh, the, uh, the Oregon Master Metallologist. Well, you, you can it's say that. It's complicated. It's like, you it know, is. it's, so as I as I was saying, it's like it's melatology, which is like my last name, Melathopolis, and I didn't do that on purpose. So, <laughs> no, I know, no, that's yeah. not on purpose. No, <laughs> I wanted to call them like the bee enthusiasts, but the volunteers associated with this program were hardcore. They really, melatologist, melatologist. That's right, melatologist, melatologist. Well, no you know, L the in Greek there. word for honey is uh, meli, right? Mm. Right. So it's kind of like it's all the root. We're all one big family here. The native bee and honeybee stuff. We have to remember that it's, Apis is a is an important branch off the diversity of the you yeah. know the 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 bee taxa. And so the thing that I was inspired what by was I was inspired by that beekeepers had bee clubs. Mm -hmm. You know how do you learn how to 
keep bees. You go to the bee club, you go to the bee school, you have a mentor, you work out problems, you know, 15 minutes before the meeting starts. And that's how you learn how to beekeep. And it struck me that I was frustrated because it seemed like a lot of the native bee research was sequestered away amongst professionals. And it struck me that, you know, if a person can make, you know, cut comb honey, they should be able to work through the, you know, the, t- the genus key for, for the bees. Like it mm. se- seemed to me that this shouldn't be an obstacle yeah. and that, you know, there's all this concern about, you know, bees, but, you know, you talk to any good melatologist, professional melatologist, they'll tell you there's not enough data to tell you anything. I was like, well, for heaven's sakes, <laughs> could we use a bee club model to, where people could learn skills and become independent and like a bee club, you know, they follow their own pursuits. One person wants to make nukes. One person wants to do this. Could we come up with a model like that? And that's what the master melatologist is. It's the first one in, in the U.S. Um, and we train people on the basic, like, how do you catch a bee? How do you database it? How do you put it on a pin? Where do you find the coolest bees in the state so you don't end up with just like a whole bunch of, you know, uh, Small carpenter bees, which, yeah. you know, if you catch your own bl- blackberries, you'll just get, that's all you'll get. How do you do all that? And and how do you make a community of people like a bee club that's independent of the university? The bee clubs run themselves and they do their own activities. How can you get that going? And that was the inspiration. So I love it because there's all this antagonism between honeybees and native bees. And I love <sighs> it that one of the predominant programs in the U.S. is inspired by honeybee clubs. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that is unique. That's very unique. That was going to be one of my questions, whether uh, native beekeepers and, and, and honeybee beekeepers will ever get along together. I can, Linda Zoll, Steve Gomes, uh, Mark Gorman, these are mm-hmm. all master beekeepers. Mark is an exceptional master melatologist. He's got an eye. He's, his collections are remarkable. He's found, you know, I believe he found like one of the fairy bees in Western Oregon, which is way out of range. Hmm. And so, yeah, of course, it's so oh, yeah. strange to me that it's become this overwrought drama. I agree. I agree. And I asked my question in jest. I mean, I was. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Poke, it's crazy. Poking the bear because I know some people are very, very passionate about that, but. It's it is uh, well. It's a, a fascinating program. I was reading up on it, and it's already sold out for 2022. And uh, you say, "Well, sign up here for 2023." Is that available? Do you have to be an Oregon State resident for that? This year, we've kind of let it open up because we've got an online training module, and we think that it really begins with the collector. Think about mm-hmm. just like the beekeeper. How does a beekeeping club start? You have somebody who's keeping bee in the neighborhood. We thought, well, we just need to train some people on how to do collection and how to make sure that data is collected properly. And then, you know, if there's a critical mass in Washington or in Idaho or in Ohio, then they'll be able to constitute themselves into something on their own. And this has happened in Washington and British Columbia. They've formed native bee societies, which I think is the proper way to go. It's an independent organization. The university supports them, but they become a, an entity just the same way as, you know, the bee associations. I really think the problem with melatology in general is that the amateurs have no place to go and they have a lot to contribute a lot more because there's a lot of programs where you just take a picture of a bee and you submit it. Yeah. People can do way more than that. Way, way more. And they'll, they're willing. As you know from a bee club, you you train the basics of beekeeping and people will go down a million rabbit holes. Yep. Well, we're coming up on the end of our time, and 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 I don't want to. I, I hate cutting it, but I do want to save just the last few moments of the podcast to let you talk about your podcast called Pollination, which is I have to admit, not just because you're here in front of me, but because I it's my most favorite podcast after like Beekeeping Today and Honeybee Obscura and Two Million Blossoms comes pollination. Yeah, your uh, podcasts are great. I love them. And, uh, you know, <laughs> we had um, we had an episode on your podcast because mm-hmm. I think it's really tremendous. And I wish as a beekeeper I had, you know, beginning beekeeper, I, ha- I could tune in every to the conversation with some, you know, experts. Um, this was developed because I often would go to a meeting 
And you'd have this interesting conversation at the coffee urn that would never get captured. And I wanted yeah. the main motivation for me was just to stick a mic in front of somebody's mouth who was interesting and I wanted to learn from and capture it. It's way less polished than beekeeping today. But it was a way for me to I thought I started it with the intent that if I didn't have a single listener, that'd be OK, because at least I had to mm. discipline myself to have a conversation with somebody once a week. Uh, I really enjoy it. And you, you have great guests and great topics. Uh, so I encourage our listeners to search out pollination when, um, and Androni Melanthopolis. And, and it's a, I wish I had your logo. I like your logo. That's a really cool one. I love your logo. I love everything you guys do. I love how you, I love how you, yeah, it's, you guys have the best podcast. It's awesome. Yeah. No, but it is. It's a, it's a, I, I really encourage our listeners to, to look it up. It, it's, it's on Apple Podcasts. I'm sure you're out in Google and every place else. So, uh, you do a fine job. I appreciate it. Use it all the time. Thank you. Jim, anything else that you want to ask? I, I, I need to say, Anthony, it's, it's, you really have a superb program and you, you're very competent in talking about it and describing it. It's very, it's very envious. It makes me, a, a bit sad that you have to age, 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 and kind of be taken out of the game. But you've got a lot going on. I'm very enviable. Well, that's high praise, Jim, because it's people like yourself who really are the communicators that, you know, I'm not even the younger generation, you know, but I had the uh, the, the good fortune as a young, you know, a young scientist and extension person to see people like you in action. And that's, that's how it's done. <laughs> well, now you're very kind, but... <laughs> Thank you for saying that. Uh, I'm going to record this and play it back several times a day. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, well, I love talking to you. Thank you. Yeah, me too. And Donnie, is there anything that we haven't asked you that you'd really like to say? Otherwise, we'll just have to have you back on a regular basis. Beekeeping today rules. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. Uh, I love it. Yeah. All right. And, and Donnie, I appreciate you taking the time this afternoon to be with us. Uh, Jim, thanks for uh, filling in for yes. Kim. And uh, it's been a great, great pleasure having you on. Thank you. We'll look forward to having you next time. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download and stream the show. Your vote helps other beekeepers find us quicker. Even better... Write a review and let other beekeepers looking for a new podcast know what you like. You can get there directly from our website by clicking on reviews along the top of any web page. As always, we thank Bee Culture, the magazine for American beekeeping, for their continued support of Beekeeping Today podcast. We want to thank our regular episode sponsor, Global Patties. Check them out at globalpatties.com. Thanks to Strong Microbials for their support of this podcast. Check out their probiotic line at strongmicrobials.com. We want to thank Better Bee for their longtime support. Check out all their great beekeeping supplies at betterbee.com. Thanks to Northern Bee Books for their support of Bee Books Old and New with Kim Flodham. Check out all of their books at northernbeebooks.co.uk. And finally, and most importantly, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on the show. Feel free to leave us comments and questions at leave a comment section under each episode on the website. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks a lot, everybody.